KUAM News Hotspot is presented by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Hello everyone and welcome again to The Hub. I'm Nestor Licanto. Our guests this week are Dr. Annette David, who is with the Guam State Epidemiologist Office and also a former um, member of the World Health Organization. We also have uh, Jim Gillen, who is the former uh, director of the Department of Public Health and um, was the chairperson for a regional committee meeting, a recent one in 2015 of the World Health Organization. Uh, thanks for joining us. We, we brought you here to talk about a, a, a news release that you put out in particular, Jim, and, and one uh, of the statements that kind of uh, just um, leaped out at me is that you said, in the race for the regional director of the WHO in the Western Pacific, which may seem innocuous, the stakes are high with deep implications for global health security. And he goes on to say, if alignments go awry and the split in the Pacific vote does not benefit the Pacific, the final vote may go to the most inexperienced candidate who is from China. All right, so a lot of mouthful there. Uh, could you kind of just give us an a, a overview of that? Well, you know, I really don't know the, the person from China. All of the other candidates I know, I've worked with, um, but this this person I don't know. So, uh, all I know is that she, she really doesn't have, doesn't bring the experience that you need with working in an organization as kind of bureaucratic as as WHO is, um, and it's uh, her only experience that I know that she has is with maternal and child health. Sure. You need a broader perspective when you're dealing with, with this part of the world. <clears throat> you know, we're talking about almost 2 billion people, okay? Um, and of that, only t about 213 million are Pacific Islanders. So, you know, there are already, the bigs and the smalls are, are already there, and and the influence that a lot of the the, the larger countries have on these Pacific islands uh, can't be ignored because they provide grants, they provide consultation, they provide technical uh, skills to people training, um, and it's very difficult uh, for the Pacific island nations and territories uh, to to get a focus on what's particularly concerns them. Uh, there's a big big push in WHO and has been for the last, I don't know, 20 years, of uni trying to arrive at some kind of universal health care. That implies uh, kind of like you're going to pr provide the same thing for everybody across the board. And you have to realize that that just doesn't fit, in, especially in the Pacific Island settings. It just doesn't make any sense. One, I mean, one size not fit no, all. It, yeah. it can't, but they, you know, they keep kind of pushing it. And I'm not sure why it is, whether it's, it's pride, the investment over time and and other things, but it, we really need to get somebody who can drive that Pacific, uh, who can drive the Western Pacific office that has a perspective on how that doesn't really work, how it doesn't match up with a lot of, I mean, you could take somebody, take a, a, a place like uh, the Solomons, 700 and some odd different islands, almost the same num number of dialects, uh, and trying to deliver healthcare uh, in those settings, compared to what it would take, what it takes to do it in Australia, it's just two completely different perspectives. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't get the right leadership at that regional office level, we're going to be still back to the same thing again. Uh, and Pacific Island countries and territories are going to be played off. They're going to respond to who's the biggest grantor. Who's, you know, some are already aligned with Australia and New Zealand. Some kind of getting aligned with China, uh, and it's a lot of it, it, you know, is because of what they can bring to them uh, that they that they need. Yeah. Okay, but uh, it's it's not with a, from my standpoint, not really a sincere effort to make them sort of independent in the delivery of their healthcare services, addressing uh, the, the real unique problems that present themselves in the Pacific Islands. So you know, you really need somebody who really understands how that that whole dynamic works. Yeah. Uh, Dr. David, let's step back first. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I understand it, the selection of this um, person to hold this position uh, is coming up. Uh, first of all, uh, explain what that position um, uh, entails and um, why is it uh, and who it is that the, the Guam representatives are, are, are supporting? Well, 
you know, this position is the regional director for the Western Pacific region of WHO. WHO has six regions. Each one is led by a regional director. And this is a position that is very critical for the region because it, it really has the equivalency of an ambassadorship. This is almost like a person who is the ambassador who has entry into all the public health networks within the region. And I was just going to say, I was thinking as, as Jim was speaking, you know, public health never occurs in a vacuum, Nestor. Uh, the geopolitics is always a big uh, contextual factor that affects public health. And so it's very important that you have in a region today, you know how fluid the political situation is today, uh, and it's important to have an experienced leader who can bridge both Asia and the Pacific as, as, uh, as the public health leader for the region. Yeah. And so the person that Guam is supporting at this point is the Dr. Person, Dr. Susan Mercado? That's right. Tell me more about her. Uh, Dr. Susan Mercado used to be the director for the Non-Communicable Disease Division in WHO. And she was really the first director who brought resources to the North Pacific. So you'll remember a few years ago, we had a very active WHO presence and support for Guam's NCD programs, diabetes programs, cancer prevention. And Jim remembers because he was director at public health at that time. Before that, the North Pacific was pretty much left to itself. The assumption being that the U.S. CDC was taking care of us anyway. But it's important for us to be part of WHO's network. We are a, a significant and strategic part of the Western Pacific. And she was the one who really brought this to play. Dr. Mercado has also been head of the Red Cross um, and is an advisor to the Red Cross Society. He was very active during the regional COVID response and until recently was a part of the Public Health Institute in Hawaii taking care of food security. She has an extensive background in health communications, in, in many leadership positions, in different, uh, in different uh, program areas. In, in fact, was even team leader for environmental and urban health at the WHO Kobe Center several years ago in Japan. Yeah, and, and Jim, as a former director of public health, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, and working with Dr. Mercado in, in the past, do um, you think it's important for her um, to, to be in this position as well? Absolutely. Uh, you know, she, again, with my relationship with her at, at the regional committee meeting that we had here in 2015, she's organized. She's uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, she is very sympathetic to the kinds of uh, challenges we have uh, in this part of the, the world. Now, we have a, a, an organization called the Pacific Island Health Officers Association, which includes the three U.S. affiliated the three U.S. territories and the three um, countries that are also associated with the United States. So that's the Marshalls, uh, <clears throat> Palau, uh, and um, FSM, and then American Samoa, Guam, and CNMI. Even though we have that organization, we still, you know, don't get the attention we think we, we need to get. We, sometimes we, when we deal with our, our colleagues, like in, in the uh, Secretariat for the uh, for the Pacific community. They, they assume that because we're associated with the United States that we have a lot of money. So a lot of the programs that may be available to some of the other Pacific Island nations don't get channeled to us. And they, they don't realize that being, just simply being associated or affiliated doesn't mean that yeah. we have everything. As a matter of fact, we know that uh, the FSM, uh, the, the countries uh, that are in the Pacific Island Health Officers Association have limited uh, resources from federal grants and, and federal programs. Uh, we're a little bit better off because we're more tightly associated with the United States, but still there's that, that feeling that, oh, well, you guys don't really need anything. Uh, you don't really need to collaborate with us down in the South Pacific because you have your own thing. But we started to work uh, a very regional approach, uh, at least when I was at public health. And we had the, the Secretary for the Pacific Commission, we had WHO, and we had CDC in Atlanta working training programs across all of these these countries, not just the American affiliated countries. And that that's the kind of thing we want to build. And that's the kind of thing that Susie, okay, I'll call her Susie, I won't call her Dr. Susie. She, you know, she gets it. She understands and she sees how a lot of the the Pacific Island countries and territories kind of get played by the, the big powers and you know it's you know you got China, you got Korea, you got Australia, New Zealand, you know, and sure. they're, they're granting 
some monies, and uh, Chinese more more than others. But that's that's an obvious, you know, why they're doing that. But um, she sees that uh, we're not getting the, the kind of attention that WHO can provide. And like I say, some kind of a presence in the north and part of this, this Pacific would really be a boon. And she agrees. Yep. So we're looking forward to having her elected. And, and on, a, on yeah. a bigger level, too, you need someone who can mobilize all the countries mm -hmm. in the region and unite everyone who has that vision, that, that uh, forward-looking vision that can bring us through whatever other health emergencies may arise. I think if there's one thing that COVID should have taught all of us, it's that we, we as, a, as a community, as a regional community, are only as strong as the weakest link in, yeah. in that network of countries. And so any country, any island that is left behind opens potentially a pathway for vulnerability for the next pandemic. So it's important to have someone who's very inclusive, mm -hmm. who's very experienced and personable and able to bring everyone together at the table. Yeah, and and how, yeah. explain how the uh, election process works. And, and you, Jim, we're, we're trying to uh, pin, uh, get the, all of the um, five uh, Pacific, North Pacific areas uh, together. How, how does that work in, to help ensure that she'll, she'll get the, the, the well, votes needed? The elections will happen tomorrow, as I understand it. They are holding the regional committee meeting right now in Manila. Um, every member state has a vote. Now, having said that, Guam, CNMI, and American Samoa are not member states. We are territories under the U.S., so the U.S. votes for us. But the other Pacific Islands each have a, a vote, and uh, all the other countries have one vote each. All right. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the implications for Guam if um, you know we get the right uh, person selected as, as you two are pr proposing. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back everyone. We're talking with uh, Dr. Annette David and Jim Gillen about the upcoming uh, selection of the WHO regional representative, I guess. And um, y you know, you both um, believe this to be very important, having the right person in there for, for Guam. Um, and, and the Guam nominee is Dr. Suzanne uh, Mercado uh, from, from the Philippines. What are the implications? Can you give us some of the implications if um, she is um, you know, in place as opposed to someone else who may not be as uh, familiar with our area? And let's start with you, Jim. Well, I, I know for sure that she's going to start a dialogue with this, this part of the Pacific for if there, is a re, if there is a WHO office presence, where would it be? And that's always a, a problem. You know, because, oh, I want it here. I want it in Pump Bay. I want it here. You know, we'll have to work out that. And probably it's going to be a place that has, you know, good communication systems and other things that you know, that would would work well f for everybody. Because you know, with with this part of the world, you know, we're, we're out there out to American Samoa, and then we're over to Palau, and we're, you know, it's a big chunk. Uh, and try to get that to work, you know. Uh, and Susie, with her skill, she can. T she can talk people into doing almost anything. She, she really is a great collaborator. She's a uh, very erudite, she, she, and she's talking from experience. She's not just making things up. She's very serious about what she wants to have happen out in this part of the Pacific. So, you know, selfishly, even if not selfishly, I, I would have endorsed her anyway, because she's just an absolutely competent, uh, uh, compassionate person. Uh, and she's in the right place to have this to have this job. And, and Dr. David, what are some of the uh, key priorities, the top priorities mm -hmm. that you would seek from her should she get the position? Well, I think very clearly for us, the non-communicable disease epidemic and how that's linked to some of the key risk factors that remain quite significant for Guam would be one thing. I think from a health systems perspective, and I'm sure you know Jim has mentioned this, how do we get to a point where we have at least a minimum set of health services for every person, regardless of whether they have private insurance or not? I think that's key, the universal health coverage, because again, as COVID taught us, it's the ones who are outside of the health system who have the biggest um, vulnerability, but, but also pose the biggest risk to the greater community. So it's important to make sure everyone has that sort of coverage. Very importantly, for the Pacific and many parts of Asia, it's also the health resource planning. Uh, we know that there is a shortage of physicians, 
of nurses, you know, of, of other health professionals. We felt it here in Guam, but you can imagine the repercussions in a smaller country, for instance, a, a remote Pacific Island country that didn't have any doctors or not enough nurses and midwives. So I think that sort of health resource planning for the future is also going to be very important. Yeah, Jim, you mentioned, uh, you guys both mentioned universal health coverage. I wanted to kind of get into that a little bit more. Can you explain what um, your particular um, vision or perception is of universal health care coverage and how that might, you know, be implemented or, or, or workable on Guam? But, you know, from a public health standpoint, preventive services, that minimum set of services that everybody should have access to uh, that have, have immediate effects on uh, their chronic disease issues have immediate effect on some of the neglected tropical di diseases that we're still faced with in, in this re this whole region. Um, you know, so that having people be able to be able to get those basic, big payoff at the end kinds of services without worrying about whether they have the two dollars in their pocket or whatever. That should just be. It's like some countries have 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 legislated an essential list of medicine that that the government program has to have. And, and it's, all, it's, car, it's cut right into the, the, the legislation. You have to have this every year. You make those kinds of commitments so there's not this business about running around, oh, we're short of this, we're out of this. But, you know, making sure that all of those essential medicines, all of those essential health services are available so, so that the family of six or so doesn't have to worry about you know, where they're, where they're going to sure. get out of the household income. And when you look at the diversity in this whole region of the percentage of their gross, gross domestic product that some countries spend on health care, and then the return on that sometimes is, is not so obvious. You don't see why are you spending 12% of your gross domestic product. And some that are spending 3% seem to be doing better in some things. So it's really organization, how you get people through the services, how you get services to the people. And again, a very instead of going all over the place with the kinds of services, we really have to get the countries and, and the islands and the territories to agree what are the essential things. Not, and it may not, have, it may not be a cookie cutter. Not everyone sure. will have the same set of services available. But there should be a set of basic essential services that each country or territory agrees to. But how, how do we fund that and who's going ah, to pay for that? That is a good question. And in fact, there are real life examples throughout the region. You know, Nestor, you mentioned that you live part of the time in the Philippines, right? Let me ask you, are you a senior? Yes, I am. Okay. So <laughs> all seniors in the Philippines have universal health coverage through the syntax revenues. So what the Philippines did is one model where they tax tobacco and alcohol and they dedicate a portion of those tax revenues to pay for health care for the poor. They started out with the poor, and then recently they added seniors. So if you're a senior citizen, 60 years and older in the Philippines, you can avail of this. You can, if you get sick, you can go to a government hospital. You can get preventive services for free. And it's paid for through tax revenues. There are other models. Mongolia, for instance, has a health promotion foundation. Uh, in, in Korea, they have uh, a similar foundation that is funded through a certain percentage of people's um, revenue, the working, the working people. So there, there's models of doing this, but there are good examples already that exist. You know, it, it is an issue of equity. It's a social justice issue, but I think also importantly, ensuring that every citizen has coverage for health services is a development issue. And, you, and, and people will say, why? Well. How can you have progress, socioeconomic progress, if you have sick people? You need a healthy workforce. You need kids who are healthy because they're the ones who are going to grow up to be the ones providing labor and, and the ones production, you know, providing the production force of a country. So in, in the end, this is really an investment in, in our social development. Okay, we gotta take one more break. Uh, we'll be back with uh, more of The Hub and Dr. Annette David and uh, Jim Gillen right after this.
All right, uh, we are back with the hub. Uh, we've got a few minutes uh, left, and uh, you know this uh, universal health coverage uh, is a very, of course, uh, interesting topic. It's come up in, in the past. You know how we fund it is, I think, the biggest biggest hurdle. But uh, I wanted to get your your thoughts since I got you both here, and, and you both are public health professionals, medical professionals. Um, GMH just recently received fifty million dollars uh, from the legislature to, uh, first of all catch up on its fiscal um, responsibilities, the vendor payables, and also 20 million for um, the, the deteriorating plant that we know as uh, GMH. And I wonder uh, what your thoughts are on, um, you know, rescuing the current facility that we have that's rapidly deteriorating and the construction of a, a new hospital. Uh, start with you, Dr. David. I, I personally agree with the governor. We need a new hospital. Uh, Band-aid solutions are not going to work. And we already know that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has assessed that uh, renovating or trying to rescue the current building is not going to be cost effective. So I, I do think we need to invest in a new facility that will care for our people. Yeah. I, I think there isn't a question. They need to have these costs taken care of. So they, they need the $30 million to get whole with the vendors and the 20 million, it's got to be spent just to bring that facility up to a reasonable level of uh, acceptable environment, I guess, you know, because you're not going to build a new hospital overnight. So you have to continue working in, the, in this thing and you have to spend the money to do it. Um, and, and I think, but the other side of that, sometimes the message is you're rewarding people for not doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, but that, right now, you just make the statement to everybody. Yeah, we're you know we're doing that, but we're talking about patient care. We're talking about patients. We're talking about reasonable working environments for these these people who have gone, gone through how many years of COVID and all of the stress related to that, and then having to work in a facility that's that's falling apart. You know, you got you got got to be able to take care of that, and, and you also have to start looking at where you know where the the problems are, why weren't they collecting what they were supposed to collect? Why are they contracting with people who say, we're going to do this for you, and it doesn't get done? Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of these things that I have problems with, and I think there, there are ways to make this thing work until a new facility is built. But that's, you know, I'm 77, I don't think I'm going to see it. But, you know, they, they, they've got to build one. Now, whether it's a campus, is, is another matter, but the focus is definitely on a new hospital. If the mental health facility, if Gitwick needs to expand, they could expand into the space that the old G, that the current GMH is in and, and do it that way rather than, in my opinion, okay, rather than have a medical campus. There's a public health uh, and social services building also in addition to a lab that's supposed to be built. I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that they all have to be in the same location. It sounds good, you know, one stop, and you just go get all your stuff done. But, uh, it, it's causing a lot of problems, you know, it, as we, all, we can agree. But right now, I support the, the $50 million. It, it, it has to be spent. Yeah. I, I know we've started with a narrow discussion of um, the <clears throat> WHO representative and why that would be beneficial to Guam with the selection of the Manila and, and, and the Guam choice. But from uh, just to wind this up on a broader discussion, um, would universal health coverage be some kind of um, resolution to what GMH's problems are? And where do we stand right now in terms of uh, our overall medica uh, medical um, uh, coverage on Guam and, and uh, the state of the you know medical um, profession on Guam? You know, hospital care is just a small part of universal health coverage. I think very importantly, uh, we need to think about how we prevent disease. How, how do we make sure that people don't need to go to the hospital? And, and so a lot of the investments, I think, have to go to that end, the downstream causes of, of disease, so that we can avoid being in this situation that we're in now, which is that you know so many people need inpatient care. So, so universal health coverage would include preventive care as well and health promotion things that ensure that people make the healthy uh, lifestyle choices to ensure that they stay healthy long into retirement, you know, in, in their 80s or 90s. That's a small part of it. Yeah, it's and not real quickly, way. Jim, a couple of minutes left. Uh, your, your, your thoughts on yeah. the medical? I think we need to show 
um, the people who put the money up, okay, the legislature, businesses, and what the return on investment is if you do invest heavily in preventive health care, if you uh, try to draw more income and revenue for this program by other sin taxes, but we're already getting pretty maxed out on tobacco, but maybe alcohol and, and yeah. some of these other things. Uh, but when you show, you know, and we've been able to demonstrate that just putting fluoride in the water, okay, was like a $75 return on a dollar investment. You know, I mean, it was a huge, you know, but then you have oh, fluoride, you're going to poison. But, you know, and how do we do it? Well, I don't know how to do it. I just brought it up. And somebody said, well, you know, we don't know how find people who know how to do it. Um, and if we can get a commitment that we can demonstrate that X patient didn't have didn't get hospitalized and what that would have cost and the, the money for that saving goes into the preventive health program rather than being spent on some some other superfluous kind of stuff. So, you know, we have to get commitment. I mean, everybody moans and groans about the fact that people are, are ill and the hospital's in bad shape and this and that, but nobody wants to make a commitment that's a hard one, you know, to really come up with the bucks to do this and come up with the programs. That, are, that is proven already. We don't need to. You know, when the United States of America spends the total spend on health care, total now, it's like $36 trillion, like national debt every year. Even a 2% increase in the cost related to that. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And where does the United States stand in terms of maternal and child health care, infant mortality, sure. uh, <laughs> chronic diseases? The, and, and they're spending all of this money sure. for no return. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, more money spent on prevent preventative health care as opposed to building new yes. dialysis centers on Absolutely. Guam, which, which we have too many. I mean, All right. Senator Rodriguez yeah. tried you know, to, to, to put something together like a health insurance plan, but it was a very complicated and complex, hard to understand. And I think that's why he had difficulty getting yeah. it. Might, so might, might need to be... Uh, yeah, we're, we're, out, we're out of time. I'm just going to say, making these yeah. hard decisions for complex issues requires experienced leadership, which brings Susan. us right back to the, the issue yeah, that we're Absolutely, here absolutely. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Uh, great discussion, Dr. Annette David and Jim Gillen. I'm Nestor Lacanto. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again next week on The Hub.